Chris, how are you? Hey, what's happening, guys? Sorry I'm so late. No problem. We just got uh, stuff back so today. We had to go get physicals today in order to in order to work Monday night. So uh, we kind of had to rush around and do that. Is that a commission thing or is it a WCW thing? Um, it's a, well, it's a commission thing, but also they figured while we were getting it done for Monday, uh, they have to get a bunch of stuff done. You know, every state like Washington and Oklahoma need the HIV test and stuff. So we're pretty much stuck in the doctor's office all day. Mm hmm. So now, are you are you are you now signed with WCW or are you in negotiations to sign? Uh, well, they've uh, they presented me with some uh, with something, and it's, I haven't uh, officially signed it yet. But we're just you know, I think it's probably a few minutes away from me doing that. Oh, okay. So um, we're just negotiating just a couple, you know, uh, like little stupid things that you know that uh, we could try and change a little for you know here and there, but no, but no big stumbling blocks. So I'm pretty much there. What uh, what's your thoughts? You've been in there for a couple weeks now. Uh, you're, you're pretty much happy to get uh, get another chance. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's uh, I mean, after all the stuff that we've been through and stuff, I'm just uh, you know, everybody knocked um, knocked Kevin Sullivan, but uh, you know, I know uh, before a lot of people had stuck up for me, and uh, and Eric just didn't want to you know want to take a chance, um, and and Kevin, you know, thank God did. So I have him to thank for that. But since we've been there, you know, two weeks with uh, Eric and Vince. Uh, They've been the two most, you know, approachable people I've ever had as bosses. I mean, not really Ken and Paul because we were friends for so long, but I mean, but they're uh, as far as bosses go. I mean, I've, you know, they're I mean, they're not like uh, like Vince was like, you know, like an untouchable person. They're always uh, they're always right there for you, and they've been really fun to work with. And to already, you know, to put us in the spot that we are, just being able to, you know, to go out there like at the end of the pay per view and then being involved in the other thing the other night. I mean, as much longer I've been around the business, I'm still a mark for me to be able to stand there beginning the show with the balloons and all the confetti and stuff on. I mean, that was really fun. What what uh, what were your thoughts as far as um you know being able to come in and within a, within a couple of weeks uh, get the cruiserweight title and uh, you know hopefully this time when they they do something with the cruiserweights they'll they'll make it a good wrestling division um, and a lot of people are looking at that so you're kind of at the focal point of of what what should be a good wrestling division because you got a lot of you've got a lot of different opponents that many of whom you've never wrestled against. Uh, well, to go against. Yeah, no, that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. There's so many you know uh, good cruiserweights in there, and I mean, well, the one thing and I've been working so long to you know. Because to, to work against the, the height thing, so I think it's really kind of like a cruiser height title, pretty much, you know. But um, but there's so many people in the division that I'm looking forward to, to working with. Um, I just hope that we get to have some singles matches instead of those six man big, uh, you know, clusters we've been having the last couple weeks. But um, but if I could, you know, be the person they're going to make the focal point of the cruiserweight division to, you know, to help make it, uh, they, you know, assist in drawing some money. I'm I'm glad they give me the chance to, and they've really, uh, you know, overlooked anything that's been said or talked about in the past, and you know. And just kind of you know uh, give me the ball, and hopefully I don't you know stumble over it this time. From your standpoint, how would you describe your your leaving, your departure from ECW? Because a lot is a lot has been said about it, and most of it not from your side. Um, you know, well, I really tried to uh, when the whole thing happened, which. Um, I know that uh, we were going to do TV, and I was on the phone uh, with Paul about four, uh, three, four o'clock in the morning. You know, kind of, you know, going over what we're going to do with TV and helping him write some stuff. And then I show up at the airport, maybe you know, three hours later, and my tickets have been canceled. And we kind of didn't communicate there for for a couple of days, and then. Um, you know, and then it was we tried to just kind of just leave it as the best thing for uh, for both of us, just kind of you know part ways, you know, as friends. It would be a shame to end you know, you know, uh, so long of a uh, friendship, uh, you know, over something like that. And uh, you know, because he knew that I would have the opportunity to go to work somewhere else. So it was just uh, you know, it's kind of personal between me and him. So we kind of left it at that. Um, let's say with that. Um, you know, you were for for a long time. You were almost like uh, an assistant booker in that company. Well, Paul knew from the time that uh, uh, that we were both kids that that's what I really always wanted to do. That's um, he kind of used to quit like the way you know Eddie Gilbert would do the things. He would carry around a little you know like a notebook and he would make up his own uh, you know his own uh, matches and you know like book like his own imaginary territory and write down every finish that you know that he saw for years. And I kind of did the same thing and I wanted to. Uh, you know, and I wanted to move along in those same footsteps in in that regard. But I guess Paul saw me sometimes making some of the same mistakes. You know, like him, he and Eddie were the you know were the two most 
Rocketeers, and they tried to make me the third, but without making the same mistakes me that uh, that they made. So he tried to kind of look out for me, maybe sometimes too much, which is what started, you know, started uh, some of the problems. But um, yeah, I was, and I had a real good time doing it, and and, and I learned a lot um, about uh, about you know booking and writing TV, and even like you know editing the show. I mean, no one else, you know, I don't think would have given me a chance to, uh, chance to do that any other company, you know, at the age I'm at. You know, you talk about that. You know, I remember you probably started wrestling 14, 15. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you were really young. Yeah, right? when I was 14. When you were 14, and your grandfather was a wrestler. Was that was that your impetus? I mean, starting in wrestling because your grandfather was a wrestler, or were you just a fan and, and your grandfather had nothing to do with it? Um. Well. Uh, well, I remember uh, first um, uh, being over at, uh, being over his house. Uh, my first memory of seeing uh, Billy Graham and the Graham Wizard doing a promo. And until that point, I didn't even know that he had that he had done this previously, you know. And uh, and I just was immediately awestruck by it. And then he would just you know he'd start telling you know telling stories as if you know I mean at the time I was only you know maybe four or five years old when I and uh, and then he started you know talking about the guys as if you know as I had like I had known them. And he explained to me and. And the first time, you know, he brought me, um, you know, uh, to the garden, and then uh, he kind of got back into it a little bit um, with uh, Angelo Savoldi. They would kind of be kind of road agents for uh, Vince Seniors, like, you know, small, like, sea shows they would do around, the, you know, in Jersey and stuff. And I got into it through then. I was put up the rings and working out with some of the guys from the time I was, you know, probably like seven years old on. Now, did you, you when, um, I, I, I think that uh, this could be this could be wrong, but I think it's right that the first time and or maybe the second match that Terry Funk had in Madison Square Garden it was one of the first was against your grandfather. Yeah, it was his, that, first, been... yeah, it was his first match in Madison Square Garden in 1974. Yeah, yeah, I, and then again, was... you know, it was like maybe 20 something years later. And, um, you know, I got to wrestle in the ECW arena, and it, and I remember my grandfather. I wanted to ask him about the match because I was such a Terry Funk mark. He just you know just said you know like how fantastic he was, but he just beat the heck out of him, and Terry did the same thing to me 20-some years later. <laughs> Let's head to the phone calls. Let's go to Lewis in Tucson. You're the first up with Chris. Hi, what's up? Yes, hey, Lewis. Lewis. Hey, Chris Candido. I can barely hear Dave. Um, Chris, it's nice to talk to you, man. You're one of my idols. I am. Yeah. You're so full of it. <laughs> seriously, you, seriously, you are. I've been uh, following your career since, uh, I guess, I could start tracing it back before Smoky Mountain when you were uh, coming out to California and stuff. Yeah, me and Sabu had the um, the classic uh, ladder match with the broken ladder. I've seen that. Now. I remember that. That is an awesome match. <laughs> but um, all I really wanted to say was uh, good luck to you, and I'm, I'm glad to see you in the cruiserweight division. You're 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 the awesomest. Well, that, you know, thanks a lot for hanging in there with me through uh, through all this stuff, and I hope, like, you know, I can keep, uh, you know, making you uh, enjoy my work. Well, your work is the best in the business right now, and uh, Tammy and you are probably two of the most talented, so uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot. Hey, Chris, you know, is there anyone in particular of, of the cruiserweights or any couple of them that, you know, have you ever worked with Kidman before? Uh, no, not up with each other. I believe at the uh, the Brian Tillman show, and uh, and I'm really looking looking forward to that because I think I mean besides you know besides Ric Flair who is you know who in my mind is untouchable. Probably I think Kidman you know last year was probably the most consistent you know uh, consistently you know top level worker there was. So I'm real excited to get to work with him. What about have you ever worked with Flair before? No, no, I, no, I haven't. I, but I was trying like hell to see if to, you know to get him to hit me with that uh, with that damn club this past Monday. But uh, <laughs> but Lex got to me first. I've been waiting for you know for 14 years to get hit by Ric Flair. I'm sure I'll get it one day. You know, I got to tell you a funny story about that. I was in Las Vegas um, many many years ago, and it was the first time that Eddie Gilbert ever wrestled Ric Flair. It was in a tag team match. And afterwards, he was walking around uh, the casino, and he came up to me, and he like he's got like one of those uh, crop top uh, weightlifting uh, shirts on, right? Mm -hmm. And he pulls it down to like show me the red, you know, from the chops. <laughs> and he was like, he was like so proud. He goes, "It's the first time Ric Flair I ever wrestled Ric Flair." And it's like, I go, and he's just like showing me the the chop marks. <laughs> well, and then, I would be the same exact way. I mean, the same exact way. I mean, for a lot of us that kind of you know grew up around the business, it made us you know uh, you're either going to become you know more of a more or are you just going to become to hate it? It definitely made me, you know, uh, much more of a mark. And, you know, as I'm waiting for the demos, I, um, the first time I got to do anything against Terry Funk, um, Paul made me keep watching back the video of the TV. The handheld guy got me running down the aisle, and I was supposed to be pissed off, but I, you could tell I had, like, the, the biggest glee in my eye. Like, I can't wait to get hit by Terry Funk. And then he just leveled me, and I just kind of, my eyes go back of my head, and I fell down. And, and uh, I'm waiting for Flair to do the same thing. 
You know, there's something about you that, that very, very few people outside of the business are aware of. And I, I mean, I didn't even know this until uh, a couple of the Smoky Mountain guys, when you were working there, told me, told me about it. And that is that, um, for your size, you were probably one of the stronger guys um, in the business, if not the strongest. They were telling me some of the lifts you could do, and I talked to you once about it. And, I mean, they were like the lifts that, you know, like maybe a Brian Adams can do or some, like, you know, huge guys that are really, really strong. I mean, are you still lifting that heavier, or are the injuries made you tone down a little? Yeah, I'm, you know, my, um, my, my elbows and uh, my one rotator cuff is, like, completely gone, so I can't go uh, go as heavy any, as, anymore, but I still go, you know, um, I mean, a lot heavier than... than than I should be able to from the looks of me, which kind of aggravates me. I would much rather be able to look like I can be that strong and not be than be that strong and not look like it. But, but yeah, um, but I guess uh, I've, been, I've been stuck with that. Hopefully one day, you know, the looking that heavy will catch up to get up to my size. Yeah, because I remember like the, when when there was one time, um, you know, Doug Furness, who um, you know doesn't uh, is not wrestling anymore, but Doug Furness was was actually when it comes to lifting. You know, one of the strongest guys who was ever in this business, but he was like, your, you know, your size, and and like he would go in the ring and nobody, he couldn't, he couldn't play the power move, you know, the the, the power thing, you know, like the strongman gimmick because he was, you know, yeah, basically it, it, your size. yeah, it just wasn't believable with him. Yeah, even though like I I remember like um you know like guys like uh, would rib him you know that were like probably couldn't lift one third of what he could but people thought they could and they were able to get away with you know being powerhouses and here he was with you know I mean his legs were unbelievable but since he was short and his upper body was was while well, very muscular it wasn't you know he wasn't gargantuan or nothing it's very, actually very similar to you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then plus, I, I would never, you know, um, like again, back to Paul. He was, was would get on my case about, you know, about stop worrying about how I looked, stop worrying about how much I lifted. But I like, totally, that to me is, you know, two separate things. I really don't. I mean, obviously, I want to be in shape so I don't, you know, look like an idiot going out in front of those people and, you know, in, in tights. But I mean, but you know, but I want to lift a certain way because because I enjoy that. It doesn't have really anything to do with with my work. And I don't think, I mean, even if I, had, you know, I would never be good at even trying to play, you know. Um, the powerhouse guy. Even if I was, you know, even if I was, you know, taller than I was, just I'm, I just I'm, I enjoy, um, you know, just being a, being a bump and heel. You know, I would never. To me, I would just I would just be bored to death being a power guy. Let's go to Dave in Tucson. Dave, you're next up with Chris. Uh, Dave. Yes. Dave, are you there? I'm here. I barely yes. hear you. Okay. I, I can't hear you at all. Actually. Well, you know what, Dave? He's there. You want to translate through me? <laughs> <laughs> actually, I think I can hear you now. Um, okay, scream. Well, we, we can all hear. Uh, wait, what did you think? I was watching some Raws leading up to WrestleMania 14. What, what did you think of those Shawn Michaels interviews leading up to Which, that show, that big Austin match against Michaels? Uh, the Shawn Michaels interviews leading up to the Boston match? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I remember him being, I remember I loved the hype for that WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, you know, the one with Tyson. I just thought that, that hype job, that was, that, was, that was really, to me, the period that, I mean, Steve Austin was already star, but to me, that was the period that made him just like the total, you know, big, biggest star in the industry. There's some particular you're talking about there, Tucson Dave. Uh, yeah, I was, I was watching, I was watching the Raw where uh, Steve Austin and Mike Tyson had that confrontation. Yeah. And I just thought that. Oh, was... the, the one, in, the one in Fresno, the very first one. Yeah. That was like awesome. The day after the Royal Rumble. Right. That was awesome. Did you see that uh, that angle they did where the uh, where Shawn Michaels addressed the Undertaker? And like went up from the rafters. I remember. I don't remember that specifically. All right. Uh, did he, he goes down, down to the ring and then take off the taker hat and stuff? Was that? Was did he do that or am I? He took, he took yeah, off the Undertaker's uh, costume and then all, the music mixed from the uh, Undertaker's music, DX music. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of remember that. I just thought it, that angle was just so brilliant. They did a lot. That whole build-up where they made Tyson and DX, and then he turned at the end and everything. That yeah, was I really, really... Like the angle where Mike Tyson joined DX. Yeah, I I, that, that whole was... thing was really well done. Yeah, yeah I was actually, <laughs> I was actually thinking about calling up that uh, WCW live where uh, Hogan was on and bringing up the uh, E True Hollywood story and seeing what oh, he had oh. to say. <laughs> well, I'm sure he liked it. He commissioned it. <laughs> what, what I, was, I remember he was saying something that Andre the Giant was near death after WrestleMania 3. Um, well, he definitely Vince was McMahon, Vince McMahon? What? Vin, Vince McMahon said something like uh, that, he, that he thought he was going to die, except he like saved his life by giving him the program. <laughs> yeah. 
I was so. going to say, uh, like, on the A&E special, uh, you said Andre was near death at uh, WrestleMania 3 and died a short time later. Uh, would you consider six years to be a short time later? <laughs> they did say that. <laughs> I was going to say... <laughs> I was going to say, hey, Hogan, uh, keep up the good work. The ratings are fine and the matches are awesome. And then as soon as Ryder would start talking and say, hey, wait a minute, isn't this going to be a fight this? Sorry, wrong, wrong show. Yeah. God, that, I don't think I'm ever going to listen to that show again after hearing I, I thought, I haven't listened to that show forever. Well, no, 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 I, I tuned in that show, the, show, the one after Sid, or Tank Abbott tapped out Sid. To hear what they would say, hear what their excuses Sid, Sid, Sid tapped out Tank Abbott. I remember that, unfortunately. No, 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 Tank Abbott tapped out Sid. No, no, Tank Abbott tapped out. But, yeah. but Sid tapped out Tank Abbott would be the correct terminology. Uh, no, I, I, just to hear, out. I just wanted to hear how Bob Ryder would make an excuse out of it. And, and I remember them saying that like, Goldberg and Tank Abbott would still be a huge money match. I can give you a for it for it right now. It's freaking fake for Christ's sakes. <laughs> just sit back and enjoy it. I, you know, I, I learned that in this, you know, in the time off I had just now between ECW and WCW, just working independence and stuff. I mean, you should you should take your job seriously at all times. I mean, you should want to go to work. Which number one, a lot of guys should want to do is want to actually go to work, you know. But uh, you know, and try and work hard. But for Christ's sakes, people try to analyze stuff too much. I mean, if someone, you know, to grab my arm and, and Try to throw yeah, me across the ring. No if I can, if I can rematch, rematch, I'm not going to bounce back. He has no basis for a rematch. His first match against a name opponent, he taps out. There's no reason for a rematch. Well, probably most people don't remember that. So thanks I, for reminding I, us. I would, think, <laughs> I, I would think that the .11 people of the audience are hardcore WCW fans. You probably would remember that. Well, actually, actually, that uh, <laughs> I thought that that was a pretty dumb thing to do with Tank Abbott, but uh... <laughs> well, like for one thing, I'm not even sure if that would even work at this point. Like, UFC, when UFC was hot three years ago, to me, Tank Abbott just comes off as a bigger version of Jim the Anvil Neidhart. That's the way he comes off to me. Well, it's, it's, it depends on it depends on how he's portrayed. I th I always thought that Tank Abbott could be done in a certain way where he'd be effective. In small doses, never in big doses, because he doesn't have the do experience remember, wrestling. Do you remember last year? I remember they brought him that working that angle with the Steiners. But that was terrible. I thought. I, thought. I actually thought that right leading up to that cage match, they did a really good job, and then they totally screwed up in that cage match. Oh, in the cage. Okay, okay. When he first came out, but but when, no, I'm, I'm talking about that whole angle because the whole deal, the whole deal with Abbott is is that is that you've got to get over his punch, which which they did do. I mean, like after a while, after kind of. False starting him three or four times. They did do that, um, but it, again, it was one of those things where he, he need he needed he still needs to knock out a sting or a luger or something like that because people they just uh, they, uh, you know they haven't taken to the next level. But at this point, if he and then with Sid, if, if he and, and then with Sid when when he was in the spot to do it, they I don't know it was just uh, it could have been worse, but it was bad. At this point, though, if he knocked out a sting or a luger, that, that might lose things. Credit, what credibility thing has left, though. I'm not sure if you yeah. want to do that at this point. Well, but, you know, there's nothing... I don't think that if you're looking at it like this, I don't think there's anything wrong with anybody getting sucker punched. You know, if, if you if the guy's gimmick is, is that he's a hard puncher, and he is, for real, and then people... Oh, some people know that. If you if you hit him from behind, and they just stay there and lay out, and they go, oh, my God, you know, it's a hard punch, but at the same time you go, but he suckered him. It wasn't face-to-face. -face. You know, it's heel heat. And you could do it to a top guy, you know. Right. That's how I. That's how I would look at it. Hey, are know. you gonna be at the Pillman Memorial Show? I believe. I'm not sure. Al, am I gonna be at the Pillman Memorial Show? Is Al there? Come in there. Al. What? Yeah. I, 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 I no no one's I'm answering my question. Uh, what was the question? Sure, Dave. Come on, let's go there. That Mick Foley is going to be there. <laughs> um, am I going to be at the Pillman Memorial Show? Yeah. Uh, yes, you will, as long as uh, we get the approval, and I don't see why not. But, uh, no, it, it looks uh, almost 100% Are you planning on going. making it? Oh, so it says almost 100%. Yeah, oh, I really want to go. Oh, really yeah, like no, I, it's, just a, it's just a question of getting the approval from the, you know, the, the, the people who handle the bean counters, but I don't see it being a problem. Okay, so I would say that there's a really good chance I'll be there. Maybe I'll get a chance to meet you. Oh, you're gonna go? Cool. Um, yeah, the yeah Mick Foley's book. I remember he uh, said something about if he never talked to Brian Pillman about his problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's planning to make every Pillman memorial. So I was, I'm kind of upset that he hasn't been added to that card. Well, the lineup of guests. 
He's he's, he's kind of retired. But Ricky the Dragon Steamboat retired as well. Yeah, that's true. I don't, I don't know. Chris, Chris, you're going right. Yeah, play on. I think it's uh, me and um, Billy Kidman. No, yeah, that's 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 gonna Wait, be really cool. Chris, do you know any more of the matches? No, uh, no, I don't. I just, uh, I just found out about this one. Uh, Kidman told me uh, the other day that he talked to the fellow Marty Adams to help him put it together, and I, that's all I know. But, uh, but I'm sure. I mean, it's a fantastic show every year. Speaking of Ricky yeah, the think... Dragon Steamboat, do you know much about his falling out with the WWF in like in 1991? Cause he told me about it. Who was that? Uh, Ricky Steamboat with WWF. Um, was that the one where he? Uh, not 1991. Because he was, or maybe it was. Okay, he. I mean, I know, I know from both. Sides, I just remember that that period that um, he gave notice to the WWF, and then when he gave notice, they wanted him to lose on TV to Undertaker. And is that right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's right. Yeah, and he refused, and there was a lot of heat about that. But he'd already given his notice, and he was going to go to w, WCW. And I think that their feeling was is that when they released him from his contract, that he swerved them when he went back to WCW later because he had told them he was retiring. So I know that's where WWF was mad at him. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, either, the, there was always problems with merchandising and things like that. I think he got a really small merchandising check and thought that he was being swerved on, on merchandising. Because, like, Ric Flair just entered the WWF, so maybe they could have mm-hmm. had some matches. Well, it's not like they didn't have him. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's like Flair and Steamboat. It's not like... I made a whole tape of like six hours of Steamboat Flair matches. I was actually thinking about like making a copy and giving one to Flair and one to Steamboat. You probably should, and I think, I think Steamboat I got probably really... From, like from 1978. They'd probably really appreciate that. They did some classic stuff. Chris, you saw a lot of that stuff, didn't you? Flair and Steamboat stuff? Uh, Flair Steamboat stuff? Oh, and I finally... Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I watch all that with, stuff all the time. I finally found a match with Hogan and Bret Hart in it from the WWF. They wrestled each other? And it's oh, no, it was a tag team match. Hulk Hogan and Billy Jack Haynes against the Hart Foundation and Danny Davis. Oh, like on a TV or something? Wow. It's on a video. Oh, wow. Wow. That's interesting. Time for uh, our WF Daily Trivia brought to you by RC Edge. The first two people to respond correctly via email at DaveMelzer at IATA.com will win a poster of a WF superstar courtesy of RC Edge. Here's today's question. Who was the first wrestler to beat Hulk Hogan in Madison Square Garden? So, anyway, that's uh, the deal. And that actually is, I don't know, it's easier than some of the recent ones we've had. Uh, let's get back to uh, Chris Candido. Chris, we're going to get to the phone calls. We're going to start with Richard in BC. Richard, what's going on? Uh, nothing much. Uh, nice to see you back in the uh, big two, Chris, where it's easier for me to watch you up here in Canada. Uh, my first question is, is uh, who you're looking forward to facing to uh, right off the bat in WCW on TV? I know I wouldn't mind seeing you, like, you and Bret Hart maybe get together if that's possible, or you and uh, Hooven Dude. Well, um, you know, I, I, could, um, I think I'm really the most person uh, in the cruiserweight division I would like to work with um, uh, is, uh, is Kidman. I mean, working the Tillman show is cool, but to get to work a program with him, I think, you know, with Tori involved and Tammy involved, um, that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Um, but, uh, again, like I said, so right now something that I, uh, like that I learned um, in my time off, that the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is being employed. And uh, so I'm just going to, you know, uh, pretty much do um, whatever they need me to do. And, uh, you know, hopefully they're going to keep me in a position that they have me in right now, which, um, you know, is a, is a part, uh, you know, being a part of the new blood group, I think we could, you know, help the company uh, uh, get back in the race here and get back in the fight. Yeah, it'd be nice being with you in there, too. I could see them, you know, finally putting in some angles for the cruiser division, which was what was lacking to take it to the next level. Oh, I, I couldn't hear any, any bit of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I, he, was, he was basically saying that, uh, you know, he, he hopes that they could, like, add angles to the cruiserweight division because, you know, in the past, they WCW had a lot of great cruiserweight matches without much storyline, you know, developing them. Yeah, but I think the last, uh, I mean, the last thing that uh, that I that I remember, and I pretty much, you know, follow everything. The last good storyline that I thought, you know, the cruiserweight deal had was, um, you know, with uh, way back with uh, uh, with Jericho and and Dean. You know, that was the last good storyline right. they had for that division. So, you know, but I, I think it's a, it's a really it's a it's a real natural. I mean, you know, Kidman obviously right now the thing he's doing with Hogan, um, that's what you know he's going to be doing. But I hope uh, after that's over, I think it's just a, a natural with the you know with the two girls involved. I think that's going to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave, uh, I've heard some rumors going around, and knowing Eric Bischoff's liking of shoot fighting in martial arts, is WCW trying to put together, you know, more of a work-style shoot division? I've heard a few rumblings about it. 
Um, they've, they've talked about doing like a group, you know, like a, a team, you know, which would be maybe Mark Coleman, Mark Kerr, Abbott, Rick Steiner, you know, names like that. You know, it's been bounced around. Guys have been contacted. You know, maybe Don Fry and Brian Johnston. So, yeah, it's been bounced around. Um, I think they'll probably do it at some point. Let me ask your opinion on that, Dave. What do you think about, you know, I mean, I think, too, like the way they're using Tank and stuff, um, you know, it, it's good. But you bring too many of those guys to say, you know, it's like, you know, this is a, you know, shoot-style match. Does that make the rest of us a work-style match, you know? I think it just, it somehow, it, you know, loses credibility, you know, to the, to the rest of us when we're out there, you know, uh, taking punches and, you know, and, uh, and you know, selling and feeding as opposed to, you know, this other guy, you know, knocking us out. Well, I think that I think that you have too many. I mean, the whole deal to me of, of using any of those guys is just the uniqueness of a, of a different character, and and to keep them, you know, not not from doing like a lot of work matches, but keep you know keep sort of sort of like this weird mystique of, uh, well, these guys aren't workers. You know, you don't say it, but you imply it, right. and that's fine. But when you have a whole group and there's six or seven of them all out there doing work to matches, not well. I think it defeats its purpose to me. You know, I mean, that's, I don't know. We're, we're, I mean, you're, you're probably going to end up being, you know, theoretically, because you're one of the better workers, in there with a lot of those guys to make them if that was you know, the case. You know, what are your thoughts about it? Because basically they're green, they're green workers who are powerful guys. Well, that, that's, um, you know, I mean, I remember uh, when, um, like when, when Mark Henry first came in, before he, it was even before the Olympics, he came into the garden to do a little thing, and uh, that's during Bill Watts' uh, short uh, tenure there and um you know and he wanted me to go out and, and bump around for him but he pulled me aside and he was like you know and, and bill watts this type of colorful language that he would use to describe mark henry which i'm obviously not going to repeat you know that and that the guy didn't know that uh, that it was a work or anything yet and um oh god <laughs> so, so that really just turned into that turned into a into a mess i mean and i was you know on the first shoot trying to get the hell out of there as quick as i can but um you know but yeah you have uh, i don't know i think too many of those guys i mean i'd be glad I had to, you know, if I had the opportunity to work with some of them, you know, like, like obviously, you know, um, Ken Shamrock became, you know, became a pretty good worker. But like I said, you have too many of those guys out there, and you know, and some of them I think maybe believe in their stuff. I mean, because it is so legit, but they, you know, just want want to prove that um, that they're tough. You know, none of us, you know, on our side of the thing, none of us doubt that they're tough, and I don't think any of us actually think that that any that that we're tough. You know what I mean? We just want to go out there and and uh, do our job, and make it to the next town. Hey, Dave, uh, out of the, the shoot side guys that are out there right now, who do you think would be the best ready to go for a pro wrestling role, if you could just pick one? Of the guys that are competing in shoot fighting today? That, that haven't done, you know, big-time pro wrestling in the big it, uh, three. It's, it's, it, okay, see, to, 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 to answer that in the ring is absolutely impossible because it's, it's, the answer is who would be the quickest to adapt. And, I mean, there's no way of knowing if they haven't done it. With, with Shamrock... What was what Shamrock went from pro wrestling to shoot fighting, back to pro wrestling. So he had a background and he kind of understood what needed to be done. He was kind of green as a worker, but also you know he picked things up well. So he did he did real well. Um, as far as the other guys, I mean, if they were to pick it up quick, it's just a question of who picks it up quick. As far as talking ability goes, I mean, Frank Shamrock to me on on UFC is the best talker. Well, you know, He's, we almost had Frank Shamrock there in um, in, uh, in in ECW. Right. Tammy met him out in the fire in the firehouse in in L.A. and I talked to him, and we uh, and um, we flew him in for for a pay per view and stuff. But um, we had him all set up for for a meeting with, with Paul. But in but in usual Paul Heyman fashion, somehow we let him kind of slip through our fingers. Yeah, that's right. I remember he went to New Orleans. He went to New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Uh? Uh, no, that's all. Uh, thanks for your time and good luck in WCW. I'm thanks a lot. Hoping to see some great matches out of you and Kidman and whoever else down the road. Thank you. Okay, anything bye. as far as, as as far as Chris? Anything as far as like uh, with the uh, interest in wrestling, Ray Mysterio Jr. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you even know what's uh, what his uh, you know um, what it looks like? He's going to be able to come back to work because he hasn't even been at any of the TVs in the back kids as far as I've been there. I believe he's going to be at TV Monday, although I don't know if he's going to appear on camera. But I, I, I heard but ready to work June, July. I mean, yeah, yeah, he would definitely be a guy I'm looking forward uh, to work with. But, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I'm definitely happy that, um, you know, that they – that, that they were confident enough in me, you know, to put the cruiserweight title on me to hopefully help elevate it, you know, back to where any championship belt uh, belongs. But I don't know if um, I think I could definitely have a good match with them, but I don't think that that's 
that that's my strength, you know. And I think I remember um, I was looking through some stuff in uh, in the house here, uh, and I was going through some old observers actually when you were down in Smoky Mountain, and was talking about you know my style of work that I you know just like a basic worker, but I threw in some stuff uh, spots that looked to be just for my own enjoyment, <laughs> and that, that's kind of you know, and that's kind of what, what I do. I mean, my you know I would kind of. I think my whole idea of that match would be with to try and keep you know uh, Ray down and just and try and wrestle him and let him get um, you know a couple of his moves and you know every now and then his little hope spots to make everything he does mean a little bit more than just going through him you know at a million miles an hour and have them just be meaningless when actually you know if everything he does is so fantastic we could you know the stuff he does and you know in one match we could, we could probably you know break it up and make six matches out of it. Yeah. Let's leave. I want to mention that we have two winners, Kelly Lucas from Massachusetts and Damon from Indiana. They answered uh, who the first wrestler to beat Hulk Hogan in Madison Square Garden was, and the answer was Andre the Giant. So, anyway, did you know that, Chris? You know what? I'm, I kept uh, I kept thinking of as Hulk Hogan is when he came back as as Hulk Hogan. You know when uh, you know like like post eighty four. Uh, you know, and I I wasn't even thinking about that Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Yeah, because, uh, well, you, I mean, you, I'm sure you remember that whole Shea Stadium program and all that, Oh, right? yeah. They, uh, I was uh, on, on, on that show. Uh, Larry Sharp and, and, uh, and Inoki worked on that. That's what I was there with, with Larry, so. Oh, so you were actually at that show? Yeah. Yeah, I think what, Fujinami wrestled Chavo Guerrero and, yep. um, and uh, Bruno Zabisco and all that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, rem I remember... Uh, God, where did we see that thing? That was um. Oh, they put it on Georgia Wrestling because I was wondering. Because I mean, I knew about, and I actually was getting. I think I was may. Have, was I getting videos by then in, of the New York Wrestling? I don't remember, but I remember that there was a, a, a Saturday afternoon, and we saw the um, Hogan body slam of Andre, which set up the Shea Stadium match. And this is uh, 1980, I believe. I mean, it's definitely 1980. Yeah, the, um, I mean, the WWF stuff um, back then, looking back at some, you know, on some, some garden shows, they used to bring in, you know, I mean, uh, some guys like when, you know, Dynamite Kid and Tiger Mask worked and, um, and uh, you know, and Fujinami came in a, a couple times. I mean, there was some, there was a lot of good shows there. And a lot of times, you know, you would, you would show up and not even, you know, you wouldn't even know anything that was going on besides who Backlund or Aaron Morales was working against. And then you would find out that all the other guys were there. There were some fantastic cards. Yeah, I mean the, the um, they I must they must have like at that same period of time brought Hogan and um, Andre down to wrestle at uh, the Omni because I remember I, I just remember oh, God, I was going I was going to driving school one day believe it or not so uh, must have gotten a ticket or something for something stupid and um, the that that afternoon uh, or the day before they must have shown the Hogan Andre angle because I'm a, I'm here at driving school right and people are coming up to me and they're just going like. Oh, my God, because at that point, I don't think anyone had ever on our TV in California seen Andre get slammed. I mean, it happened a couple of times before, but they're going like, and, of course, nobody knew Hogan yet because we never got the New York TV, but we got the Atlanta TV on cable. And so who's this giant blonde guy who no one had ever seen before, and he just slammed Andre? It was like a pretty big buzz at the time. Yeah, I mean that 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 that, um, that Georgia TV. I mean, I remember when that first came in, uh, you know, up north here, and that and that was a big deal. Saturday night, you know, I didn't didn't move uh, from you know from six oh five to eight oh five. I was glued to that show. That was some fantastic stuff. You watch the Freebirds and all that stuff that period? Oh yeah, well that I stole my Michael Hayes dance from. <laughs> yeah, that was when I sh I remember watching that stuff with uh, when the Freebirds first showed up. It was like. You know, when the Road Warriors first showed up there a couple of years later, I mean, that was just some awesome. That was, I mean, for its time, it was really great. Well, I, mean, I think I mean, even going going back on it now, I mean, I, you know, there's nothing really um, besides you know exposing. Uh, I mean, if, if that's even a good word to use, you want to know. But if they're doing these, you know, like these shoot type like insider angles, there's nothing really new to do anymore. I, mean, I think we can go back and look at some stuff that was done there and some stuff that was done in Memphis, and you can really probably you know you know rehash some of those those storylines. Just would put a little, little new twist on. It. I think that stuff can still uh, you know can still draw money unless I'm you know I'm, I'm wrong and you know had I not gotten chance I would still be, you know, in Smoky Mountain if you had it had to go, but I, I thought we still had a chance there. Uh, there's something, there's something I should ask, ask a question about Smoky Mountain, um, and it was uh, an angle that you did there where you dressed up like a baby. Uh, can you describe <laughs> that one? Yeah, I just, um, I, I, every time, it was just kind of, uh, 
Cornette just kind of grabbed it out of the way, you know, that I would sell when I would, you know, just take a couple bumps, uh, a couple bumps from the baby face and just, you know, like kick and jump down and just and pout and stuff. And, you know, and then he said, well, you know what, next time, you know, uh, Hildebrand, uh, rest of soul, we you know, get on you, you know, like cross your arms and hold your breath. And then it just started getting over so well. Everybody started, you know, chanting and cry baby. Then he had, you know, Tim Horner go out and, you know, started, you know, call me on, on the promos. And we had the, you know, loser has to wear a, a diaper match and or drink a bottle match. And then we did the deal where, um, I had to wear a uh, wear a uh, baby bonnet if I ever lost a match on on TV. So Horner would come and interfere every week, so I would lose by by DQ. And he would come out with you know with my very prestigious WWA belt on. I chased him around, so I lost by count out. I had to keep wearing this, this bonnet for weeks and weeks on end on on TV. And uh, since we were right there, you know, in uh, in Knoxville where the TV was there, that's where we were living. You know, I would just just to kind of just get a rise out of it. Like me and Tammy would be going grocery shopping. I wait a second, I'd put on I'd put on the bonnet to leave the house <laughs> to really just put the angle. Over. <laughs> just really just to just to start a little fun argument at home, but I yeah, I, I want to think all over the place. <laughs> I can't believe you weren't shocked. Um, yeah, in the, the, the the first time I ever heard of the, of the bonnet would have been um, maybe Terry Gordy, but all that 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 crybaby stuff that was stuff that Bill Watts did to Cornette. So I think that like since he had it done to him, he was going to make sure he had it. Yeah, he was making sure somebody else had it done to them too. <laughs> but uh, right. like the time that we did in uh, in Knoxville is where we did the. Um, the diaper match, and uh, and I forgot to wear under trunks. I trunks. I went underneath, underneath the ring and pulled the cut wearing the diaper. I'm like holy damn! And I didn't have anything else to, you know, I just had to kind of make sure I held the diaper up, and I didn't make it the whole way back to the locker room with the diaper up. <laughs> oh God! Uh, real quick, uh, this is from Ryan Anderson who wants to know what do you what, what do you think were your best matches? If you had to like pick your own uh, highlight tape, who would your matches? What, what matches would you pick? Uh, definitely. Um, uh, my program against against Tracy Smothers, I think our Bluegrass Brawl ladder match uh, was probably definitely you know a highlight of them. Uh, the match me and Tracy had at the NWA uh, tournament, um, me and Johnny Smith against uh, Doug Furness and um, Danny Crawford at, at Cork and Hall. Um, there was nothing I had uh, that was overly memorable as far as you know being a good match in the WWF. Unfortunately, um, I think you know I made I made the best out of what I had to do while I was there. But uh, but I think that was probably you know uh, some some of my uh, my best stuff. Actually, I had a good match there with um, with uh, Al Snow, a dark match when he was doing the Avatar thing that I thought was a great match. And then we got to work a bit. We were doing those those four team tag things, and you know the Rockers had to get eliminated quick. So me and Al got in and did about you know eight minutes worth of spots in in the first twenty seconds of the match. But uh, but I wouldn't qualify that as good. It was just you know we got to get out of our system. But Tracy Smothers was definitely hands down I think the most talented guy I ever worked against, and the guy that I think you know should definitely have a you know a job somewhere in this business you know on a full time basis. What were you know like going back? Uh, your thoughts on you know you spent a long time down in Smoky and everything. Uh, what was the plus of the goods and the bads of of working down there, moving down there? I mean, for your career, it kind of made your career in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, I mean, had that place not happened, I don't know what you know what would I you know would have ended up with me. I mean, uh, Eddie Gilbert had started me. Um, you know, as ECW first opened, uh, he brought me in there. But um, you know, but who's to say? You know, and how that would have went. But um, but that definitely uh, is what made uh, what made my career. And and uh, after I was done working uh, the program with Tim Horner, um, you know. Cornette knew he wanted to keep me, but didn't know anything to do with me. And uh, you know, and uh, and Tracy stepped up, and you know, and he offered to work with me, and offered to put me over, you know, in order to get the angle started. Um, so that was definitely, um, you know, I mean, it, had I not been there, I don't know if I, you know, where I, I would have, uh, where would have ended up. And, and living down there, if it, if I had my way, um, you know, if I was the boss of the household, it would have still been living down there. But <laughs> as you see, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Let's go to Craig in Ontario. Craig, you're up with Chris. Hello. Uh, let's go to John. You got to go quick. Anybody? Hello. Were, I, anyway. Uh, All right. Let's go to, uh, <laughs> where is everybody? What's going on here? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is. Is anybody here? I'm here, Chris. Is Chris there? Yeah, I'm here. Who are you? My name's Craig. How are you hey, doing? Craig, how are you? Oh, Craig, we finally got you. Uh, I have three things to ask you. Okay. Uh, in '96 at SummerSlam. You had that neck brace. What happened? That was when, um, in August, um, the Smoking Guns were doing their finish move where Bart would hold you like in a side slam, and Billy would 
come off the top with the leg drop. Um, me and Al had been, I guess, for like 20 days in a row, been doing that um, that uh, the, that tiger uh, full Nelson suplex on the road, and laying on the, the top of my head for like 20 days in a row. And then that last day of the tour, I was with Bart, and I was slipping off his back and couldn't hold him. By the time Billy... You know, that's the top and jumped off. My head was only about a foot or two off the mat, and the bar was just kind of holding my ass up in the air, and they bent me totally in half, and I fractured my C5 and C6. And, um... And I, I was in like you know in a hard collar neck brace, having to lay flat at home. But uh, I kind of I lied to the office because they didn't want to miss the pay per view, and um, I wasn't supposed to take that take that soft neck brace off. And uh, they thought that I was wearing it you know for protection. I'd be able to go to the ring without it and you know and work because I had I had kind of to about how bad the injury was. And I was walking out out, out to the ring, and uh, I think it was Jr. covered up his mic and what are you doing with that on? And I I have a broken neck. Where? He said, don't you dare tag in. And uh, so we had to get rid of Tom got pinned real quick, and we got ourselves out of there, and then I got kind of in trouble. <laughs> uh, my other question is, my friend Greg and I, we argue over this. He says you and Tammy aren't, aren't, aren't married, and I say you are. Well, in, because I keep hearing rumors on the internet saying you you yeah. said that you are. I get I get I get asked that all the time, and I don't even know the answer. Well, you know, I'm, uh, in, in New Jersey, if you have cohabitated for more than seven years, you're um, common law married. And we had and we had a ceremony um, in the in the Cayman Islands. Uh, I guess I don't know, maybe four years ago. Where we just, you know, but it was like with a crazy Cayman witch doctor guy that I think might have been legal just on like that spot of sand we were on. But, um, but we have, you know, as far as you know, we're concerned, we're married, and coming up in June will be will be ten years. And she moved with me to Memphis only about, uh, you know, just a you know a couple months after we knew each other. So, um, so we've been together every minute of the damn day for the last ten years. So we're pretty much married more than anybody else in the world is married. Uh, Although not legally, I don't think. It, well, in Jersey, we're you know, common law married, so we I get half of our stuff. Uh, so you, so you're like the only one in wrestling who's not sure if you're married or not. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, in in my mind, I am, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, I I have a dream match that I've always wanted to see. You and Jeff Jarrett. Um, well, we, um, we, we worked a couple times. I don't know. I just always wanted to see those two. We, we worked a couple times, um, when we were in Memphis when, uh, when he was, you know, he was a baby face and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, actually once on, on TV, me and some masked guy that was like, you know, janitor at Channel 5 worked against him and Robert Fuller and he was definitely, you know, uh, he was, he was great to work with, but I think, you know, we would only have a good match with him, you know, being the baby face, because uh, as a heel, I think we kind of have a lot of the, you know, somewhat of the, you know, same uh, same style. But he's definitely a guy that I would like to work with again. Did, when you were in Smoky Mountain, did you ever wrestle uh, Jericho and Lance in a tag match or ever separately? Uh, yeah, I wrestled. Um, I think as as a team, uh, me and Brian Lee uh, wrestled. Um, Chris and Lance, um, maybe just only a, hand, a handful of times. A lot of times, Chris was gone to either Mexico or Japan or something like that. But I would, you know, but we wrestled, uh, you know, a handful of times, maybe like 15 times. But I wrestled Lance down there a load of times. And of course, in ECW, we've, you know, we've been in there together a load of times. So we pretty much have our have our routine work out. We we opened up with the, you know, we always open with the uh, the um, Flair Steamboat from Nashville chop around the ring opening. That's our little thing. So. We've been together there enough times. If I can ever find any tapes, and I am looking for tapes of Smoky Mountain. Of, of, of wrestling each other in Smoky Mountain? Of, of any matches of yours that you think are good, which one should I buy if I can ever find any tapes? No, they pretty much all sucked. Tracy Smothers ladder match, <laughs> which we actually just talked about. Yeah. That, that, that one stuck up, stood up to me. It was on it was Blue, Blue Glass Brawl, and they showed it on TV uh, probably the next week at, in like highlight form. And, yeah, and we also had we, had we had a ladder match on on uh, on TV too. It, it right. was the week that the Thrill Seekers made their first um, you know their first actual TV match debut. And we're, we had to, me and Tracy were having so much fun working with each other that after Lance and Chris had worked, they had kept banging the pole. So the, you know, so the, the check on the string was hanging like about the third rung on the ladder. And we just kept doing spots around it because it didn't, you know, I mean, it was, we could just kind of stand on our tiptoes and grab, and grab the, uh, you know, grab the envelope. But, uh, you know, we had a, we had a blast with that one too. But me and Lance had a couple singles matches on TV that were really good. And I think me and, um, uh, Boo or Balls where we had a couple of real good ones too. Okay, we gotta we gotta go because we gotta get to Adrian in Australia. Adrian, you're next up. 
Hi, Chris. I just, Adrian calling from Sydney, Australia here. I just want to hey, say what's you on signing with WCW. Thank you very much, man. How are you guys doing? Uh, very well. We, um, Dave, we had Chris down here in Sydney last year for some shows, and he put on That's some right. absolutely fabulous matches. I'm not sure if you heard, but probably the best match I've ever seen him in was the match he had in Melbourne with Tabu. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a match on tape of Chris that was as good as that one. I was just wondering how you feel about working in the cruiserweights now compared to, I think you your style's more conducive to the to the heavyweight style. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I really think it is too. But um, you know, but again, I guess it's you know it's a spot that they saw that um, that they can still use me as a cruiser wrestler. I could still work that style, you know, uh, if you know yeah. if, if if it's if it's called for. But I think um, Kevin Nash kind of had the idea when he was booking of kind of like a, like a cruiserweight bully type of guy, yeah. you know, who would try and you know kind of kind of like ground those guys and like I said before about the stereo you know let him get some of this stuff in and so we'll just get even you know get more of a reaction you know uh, you know when he would get those hot moves in so hopefully that's what you know th that's what I'll do but eventually you know if I you know either make it uh, I don't want to say you know be elevated to heavyweight class but I don't want to demean you know the yeah. cruiserweight belt but I don't but at the same time maybe even elevate the cruiserweight title to you know to mean uh, you know what it did like when Jericho had it yeah, I think your, your one flaw was, is probably the fact that you've always been too unselfish in the ring. I mean, you, you try and make, I mean, you do a fantastic job of making everyone else look good, but you sometimes do it at your own expense. Um, yeah, and, you know, and, uh, and I've been told that a lot too, like, you know, um, Tammy will tell me too, a lot of times at ringside, she'll look at me like, why are you doing that for me? That's just, um, I don't know, that's just the kind of way that I was uh, raised in the business. I know, like, the most recent uh, in uh, ECW just before I left, and I pretty much knew I was on my way out, you know, and I was supposed to um, the, supposed to uh, take the fall, but, you know, I was supposed to win the match. But um, they, they, they wanted Rhino to get beat, but, uh, but, I, but I, you know, offered to, you know, to take the, you know, to get beat instead, because at the time we were building Rhino so heavy that it would really hurt him, his credibility at that point, to get beat. And I just, you know, thought that, you know, that I can keep myself over just by, I don't know, no, but by being me, I always, you know, I idolize Jerry Lawler a lot too, and you know, and the yeah. King can, you know, can one week, you know, lose to, you know, some idiot he would bring in with a damn monster mask on, and the next week, you know, still, you know, draw if he had to, and I, you know, hope to one day be able to attain, you know, attain that status. That's why I've always tried to work. How are you finding it going back on the road again after having so much time off? Well, you know, the, for the time that I was actually, I guess, officially unemployed, I was probably working more than I ever have in my life. I was taking, in, you know, indie shots, you know, in uh, L.A. and and then, you know, one in uh, uh, in Ontario and then back for some other guy in, in Vegas. I mean, I built up a lot more fruit and flyer miles being unemployed uh, than I ever did when I was actually working. Just uh, yeah, the money. I mean, we'd love to have you back here someday too, Chris. But I'd love to get back there, man. He had a great time out there. Yeah, awesome. Glad. Okay, well, I'll let you get back to the next caller. Okay, thanks so much, Adrian. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. Bye. Take it easy. How's, uh, how was XPW on Saturday? Oh man, and you know, um, we really, uh, we, I think we, we had a fantastic show. We we were going to curtain off the building, you know, for, um, for about uh, for about like three thousand people, but we just kind of, you know, just like blacked it out with with the lights, and you know, uh, I think we had right around, you know, right around that number, and. Um, and I think that we gave the people a really good show. Um, the, the guy that runs the place has been really, you know, open to. Uh, he brought uh, myself and Shane in. Usually we come in, you know, a little bit early, and we've been helping him um, write, t write the TV. We have some, you know, some decent stories going right now. And uh, and I think in the match I had with Shane, he had to change his um, his flight to uh, to an earlier flight. There was no room on the red eye. We were at like 1:30, and he had to get to the airport by by 10:30. So we had to run in there, and and all we knew was just double knockout. Here comes Sabu, and that's and that, that's all we knew. And to, and to go in the ring, and pretty much me and Shane had never, never really worked against each other. All I did was that one spot on TV where I punched him in the eye uh, a million times trying to bust him open. That was all we've ever touched each other. And uh, I think we had a fantastic match, and we didn't, you know, talk over any of it. We just went out there and worked, and that was a real treat to get to do that with somebody, uh, you know, that, as talented as that, that, you know, you could just kind of feel what they were doing. And uh, I think we had a great match. And uh, in the last match, uh, Alex Rotten and that uh, this guy Supreme that, that they're pushing, who's, you know, like their hardcore, crazy, Axel Rotten type guy, had a real fantastic match, too. Let's go to CJ in Washington. You're probably the last, it'll be our last caller. All right, great. Just a, um, a couple of quick questions. Um, over the the, the uh, past course of, uh, of several months, there have been a lot of, I guess, nasty and, and probably untrue things said and written about Tammy. And I guess my two questions are, A, if you can tell us what's the real scoop and how she's doing, and B, what do you have to say to all the folks that have, have seemed to be making a living spreading you know, a lot of unkind things about her. Well, uh, I'm glad that I can help somebody make a living. 
And the truth on Tammy is, is she's actually um, from the planet Mars. And um, and uh, and she right now is in the back of cultivating a crack in our backyard. I mean, you know, no, no matter what I say, nobody's gonna, you know, the people believe what they want to believe. It's just like, you know, when you have somebody who's wrestling real or fake. So, um, you know, and I'm through, you know, trying to defend us. I just hope now that we've been given the chance to get back on national TV and back in the spotlight. And Vince and Eric have given us, you know, a hell of a spot to prove ourselves. And I just hope that we can prove ourselves to be, uh, you know, to, to be in the spot that, that we belong in. And I, you know, and I can't do it anymore by words because the people that stood behind us, I, you know, appreciate, and the people that that didn't, I hope I get to prove them wrong. I do too. Thank you much for your time, Chris. Is there anything like, uh, you know, with, that, that if you could put your finger on something as far as like a, a downfall, um, is there any one thing, or is it just something that that happened to you and you just had to fight your way out of? Well, you know, the, the whole deal started as a. Uh, um, Paul wanted us to start um, working, uh, you know, work on the internet people to make me like the new loose cannon type of character, and um, and you know, he wanted me to take off, you know, like two months because I had to get uh, some stuff uh, done to my knee, and he, you know, said, well, let's use to our advantage, and you know, I want to do this with you, and um, he said, but there's a chance it could backfire in our face. I said, well, why the hell are we doing it? He said, because, because you know, because it could be great. And he gives you the whole pep talk, and you know, and. He couldn't have you do anything because he just he couldn't see you so motivating. And it ended up just uh, blowing back on our face. And a lot of the problem was is that, that I was off, and I was playing on that damn computer, and every time somebody would say something, I would have nothing to do, so I would just fire back at them. And when you fire back at somebody, their first thing to do is fire back at you. So part of it, you know, was was, it was my own fault. I should have just kept my mouth shut, and it probably would have just, you know, not gone as far as it did. But, uh, but I think just even attempting to do, you know, the whole, you know, the whole, um, I'm the new crazy loose cannon guy, angle to that extent was probably, you know, a bad idea. But I guess all in all, um, it probably worked out for the better because I probably wouldn't have got a chance to be here in the spot I'm in because I guess now I'm, you know, became so much of a controversial figure that now, you know, it kind of was controversial for, for you know, for Vince uh, and Eric to put me in that spot. So maybe that'll, you know, make people watch and, oh, there's that, those nutty, screwed up people on TV. Maybe they'll want to watch us. I don't know. I don't know that's gonna. I don't know that that's gonna help as far as uh, you know. You, 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 you're you're, you're put in a. You've been put in a good spot though. I mean, a spot to, you know, like, make it, and uh, it's that's really all you can ask for. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I didn't even. I, I really didn't think. Like I said, I've been around the business for for 28 years, and I always tried to really be realistic about what my spot was, and and then never in a million years did I think. You know, as the show went off the air last week, we did some stuff in, in the ring that I assume they're going to have to show this week to follow. You know, to follow the storyline. I never thought I would be in an arena full of people. You know, um, kicking the crap out of you know out of a blade up Hulk Hogan. You know, so I mean, you know, so the spot that they that they put us in to give us a chance to prove ourselves was a pretty damn you know. Spot where people are going to be, you know, we're going to be in the spotlight, and um, I can't ask for anything more. And, uh, and this time, if it screws up, then I have nobody to blame this time but myself. Okay, Chris, I want to thank you very much for doing the show today. We're totally out of time, and I want to remind everyone that tomorrow we will have uh, Ray Mysterio Jr. on the show, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 